Okay, we're going to talk about BladeBridge Studio. So BladeBridge Studio is a different kind of tool than you might be used to seeing from BladeBridge. As many people are accustomed to BladeBridge's capabilities in conversion of old code to new code versus Studio, which is all about creating new code from scratch. So if you have a new project or a new deployment or a new data flow, something new that needs to be created, then we really should be talking about Studio. So let's take a deep dive into this. The first thing I want to do is to cover a few terms that I'm going to be using a lot during the presentation. The first one I want to go over is runtime on the right. Runtime is the type of stuff that we obsess about every day. It's the stuff that we have copious meetings about related to security and availability, you know, all of those kinds of topics. Also in runtime, we're worried about throughput and capacity to address a large audience. So runtime environments would be things like databases, ETL tools, even large applications like SAP and Oracle all represent runtimes versus a design time. Now a design time is Word, Excel, even some design suites like Adobe and other types of design environments. And in design suites, there's usually not that rigorous of uptime requirements and other things like that because essentially you're working at a design level event. So now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about the typical process that you might go through in a manual data integration project. The first step in the process happens on the left with the data analysts. And what typically occurs is that you have the data analysts working on an Excel spreadsheet together in a design time event. And in that design time event, you have them mapping source to target objects. So you literally have all of the source data objects and you need to map those data objects to a target database schema and, uh, and defining along the way the changes that have to occur in the data in order to arrive in that target schema with the appropriate changes. Once that document gets fully assembled, then the data analysts hand it off to the ETL or ELT developers. These are the people that work on encoding the integration runtime environment. So what they literally have to do is interpret this design time Excel spreadsheet into the runtime integration tool to ultimately land that data uh, so that it's available uh, for a data consumer downstream. Now, innately, the process of building this ETL pipeline, it's expensive, it's tremendously complex, uh, and you've got a lot of people involved, so that adds the complexity, and it's innately vendor locked. Uh, why? Well, it's because we're literally coding this stuff into a runtime of your choosing. What that means, though, is that getting off of that runtime is seriously complex. Even vendors of these runtime systems have a difficult time converting their own clients to perhaps a new cloud offering or what have you. So the way Studio really starts to solve this problem is we live in the design time world. And in that design time, we define in Studio all of those assets that you would have normally put into Excel, but into an organized interface for designing a mapping routine. But beyond just having the ability to map those fields, you also have the capacity to have the technical teams engage in defining standards, naming conventions, connections, technology uh, selections, patterns, and all sorts of configurations. By doing all of that kind of technical work up front, building the content functions and mappings for the data analysts is actually very easy to do. Now, here's where the magic of Studio comes in. Once all of that design time activity is completed in Studio, we can then run Studio and what it will produce is code, literally files will come out of it, and those files will be generated for the runtime of your choosing. So let me say that again. It's gonna generate code, but when it goes to generate code, you get to choose what platform you want that code to ultimately land into. So this changes the paradigm significantly. No longer am I locking myself into a runtime vendor. I'm literally just generating code for the runtime of my desire. Okay? 
All right, so what does this mean? It means that the moment code comes out of Studio, it's your code. So your code is is immediately yours. It's not it doesn't belong to BladeBridge, okay? And that code can in, get injected to uh, whatever platform you selected to have it generate for. So if you decided, if you told Studio, hey, I want to run uh, this code into Talend, then it would generate native Talend code, and you could just literally inject that code into Talend, and Talend wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't know any difference whether it had been hand built in Talend or whether it's being done from the automation of Studio. What this is effectively doing is separating the code from your runtime. So you're creating a loosely coupled relationship between your code and your runtime. It's a very powerful concept. And as you could imagine, it gives you full control of your runtime environment. One of the biggest challenges that organizations have is that they become married to their runtime environments. They don't want to be married to their runtime environments, but they are because moving off of them is so darn difficult. Now let's go dive into the assets and we'll go deeper and deeper as the slides move on. So at first, we're going to have the, the technical teams build the design patterns, the technology stack specifications, and the project governance in the configuration screen. So this is all configuration-based. Then we can move and, and have the mapping specifications get built uh, by the data analysts as well as the, uh, the tech uh, savvy folks in the organization and the SMEs. And they all get to, to work from the same uh, interface. When we go to execute BladeBridge, what it does is it produces these three things at a high level. And we'll go into a deeper uh, slide on, on all the assets that get produced. But at a high level, you have all of your code. Literally, it's going to have a network file location that you've specified. And it's going to dump a bunch of code into that file location. Uh, you know, ETL scripts, SQL scripts, scheduling jobs. Uh, you know, it could be Python scripts, what have you. Okay, and then uh, in addition, it's going to auto-generate uh, the documentation. Nobody likes building documentation. This actually auto-creates that documentation for you. And then in addition to that, it actually generates lineage. So for all of the content that BladeBridge Studio produces, uh, it will actually generate lineage for that content. So we've spent a lot of time talking about how Studio can uh, help sort of separate the code from the runtime and give you the freedom that you want in your runtime environment. What we haven't talked about is the actual acceleration itself. How does it accelerate the process of building code? And that's what I want to address on this slide. The first thing I want to point out about uh, you know, any kind of ETL or integration or database management coding, uh, all of that activity is, is very manual. It's literally pipeline by pipeline. You design each node in that pipeline by hand. Even if the tooling that you have for ETL or integration, uh, that tooling uh, requires you to at least start somewhere. And so you have to essentially build by hand each of the nodes in those pipelines, even if it's a reusable pipeline. And so all of those, uh, all of those activities have to be done uh, by individuals while you're building out your data warehouse or integration routine. And as you can see, these little some of the smaller bubbles, you've got standards and practices. And, and what we rely on when we have a large development staff like this is that uh, everybody is working and from the same page of music when it comes to generating these new pipelines. And the truth is that's literally impossible to do because you've got many people using their own practices to produce the environment. So you get a very inconsistent result. Studio, on the other hand, is largely uh, auto-generating the nodes for your pipelines. It's literally generating those pipelines automatically. Um, and how does it do that? Well, what it does is there's a deep automation that's been built that's based on a series of, of configuration stacks that inherit from each other. And so at the very base uh, of this logic stack, uh, the automation has some very low grain automation related to how queries come together and whatnot. And then on top of that, you have a configurations for practice logic. So these are practices just like you'd imagine. These are 
you know, slowly changing dimensions and third normal form and, uh, and, and staging areas and uh, Kimball and Inman and data vaults and all sorts of different kinds of practices and methods. And then on top of that, you have the global configurations like we talked about earlier where the technical staff members of your data management project can define sort of the global variables of the project. And on top of that, you have the actual mappings themselves. And these are just simply mappings like customer underscore n to customer name. So you're just mapping from one database element to another. Now you'll notice that the labor really comes in at the standards and mappings level and you're not having to sort of uh, generate every pipeline by hand because those pipelines get auto-generated. So ultimately the, how this expresses itself is in the overall amount of time saved. So over a period of projects, uh, you'll see that you'll be able to take on more projects because you can get them done faster and the amount of uh, effort that you're going through is is far less. And what we're finding is that it's not that these project teams are uh, are not busy. It's that they are able to take on more work. And and truly, most organizations they have the need for more work. It's just the teams can only work so fast. Okay, so now let's look at this at the full view here of all of the asset opportunities that you have when you're working within Studio. So here you have Studio on the left, and then I'm going to start from the top. It can generate your database content. So these are all this is all the SQLs that will be necessary for your databases. So it's going to generate all the code related to the databases of your choosing. And you can see there's a whole bunch of databases over on the right that it can generate native code for, and that's not even the full list. So in all of these cases, it's not the full list, but it's, it's, it's a lot of them. Uh, and then it'll generate the, uh, the ETL scripts. So um, any kind of integration tooling script, it'll generate natively for those environments. Um, and then you've got your scheduling and orchestration. So it'll generate native code. Today we support Prefect and Autosys. Uh, we are generating support for Airflow and Control-M. So that those, those two are coming. And then in addition to that, of course, you know, we're generating code. It would be nice if this code could sit into a, a repository uh, like a GitHub. And so it'll generate all of the uh, requisite uh, code for, um, uh, for automatically pushing this code up into a source control repository. So you get a lot of power uh, just, just at the push of a button in terms of uh, generating code for an environment. So let's just take a look at what this might look like in, in, a, in a sample scenario. What we're doing here is we're overlaying the runtime on top of, of uh, you know, BladeBridge Studio generating that runtime. So what you essentially have is you have the code getting generated into your source con control, but of course all of that, it, all of that uh, content gets pushed into your uh, runtime elements. And so if we go from left to right, you've got your data on the left and your users on the right. And, and so what we're going to do typically, and then we're, I'm assuming like a cloud situation, we're going to pull all the data and, and, and dump it into the cloud. Usually that sits in a landing zone or some kind of landing environment. And BladeBridge can generate the code to produce that landing uh, zone. And then from there, there's integration routines that get executed on that data. Um, and those integration routines, so this might all happen in the same database in the cloud. Uh, but but process wise, you'll have your your integration environment that's that is uh, executing the integration scripts, and then you have perhaps your data warehouse and all of the scripts related to generating that content is um, is gets generated by BladeBridge Studio. Then atop all of this, you have your orchestration. So you have orchestration from end to end, uh, and that orchestration uh, can be auto-generated in studio as well. So you can see the power of being able to control so many elements straight from a single global configuration layer where you can just push down the code to uh, the environments that, uh, that you would like to uh, execute from. And the beauty here is that you can uh, change your landing, you can change your warehouse, you can change your integration layer, you can change your orchestration tooling um, because you have a, an environment that generates the code for all of those places. 
Now, I want to go through some common questions that people have before we end this presentation. So one of the first questions people ask is, well, is Studio an ETL or ELT tool? So the answer is no, because it is a code generation tool, which can publish to N number of ETL tools. And, you know, people say, well, N number, you guys, you know, you're not, you're not supporting every, uh, you know, nuanced uh, integration tool. But the answer is that if you have an integration tool that you really, really want, the uh, the expense of adding a new integration tool is is not over the top. It's about a it's about a fifteen to twenty day event to create a new writer, uh, if that. In some cases, it's shorter. So it's so you really can essentially support uh, any integration layer. And the the beauty here is compare you know, uh, you know fifteen to twenty days to usually six months to a year. Uh, for converting a runtime environment from an old code base to a new one. So so it's really a tiny, tiny amount of effort in comparison to actually having to convert, uh, a, you know, straight runtime environments. Uh, the next question is, will Studio be running out uh, or running our data integration routines? So in other words, will Studio be running those in, uh, routines live? And the answer is no, because Studio does not have a runtime environment. Remember, it's a design time environment. It only produces code for the runtime of your choosing. So it literally produces a, uh, let's just say Informatica, you have a a native Informatica XML file that gets imported into Informatica. And to Informatica, it's a, it, it literally is a native file that it can use uh, as a, as a uh, uh, it can use all the repository objects to, to run. Um, <clears throat> the next point is if you turn off Studio, uh, your runtime environment will continue to operate with the code that was generated. So you can literally turn it off uh, and your runtime will still uh, be operational. Uh, and and so there's no risks in in leveraging Studio. Will Studio have to be regularly maintained to keep our production working? And the answer is no. For one, because it's it is not uh, it is not in between uh, your production environment. Your production environment operates independently from Studio. For one, um, but the maintenance of of Studio is similar to maintaining any design suite. So it's very very low. Now, if we stopped using Studio, would our integration routines stop working? And, of course, the answer is no. And there's literally no risk to your runtime environment if you turn off Studio. But the advantage of running Studio is that you get continued flexibility in choosing your desired runtime and it automatically uh, generating updates. So uh, it, you could think of Studio as almost a, a macro language for all of your integration routines and orchestration. Okay, so – that's uh, that ends our presentation, and hopefully this is a helpful guide. There are some other um, slides here that I'm not going to uh, go through in the demo, but they're mostly lists and um, and just sort of detailed slides to go uh, some customer case studies, um, and this is just a breakdown of of uh, some of the assets that we went through earlier, and then some uh, studio benefits by role. So hope this was a helpful presentation for you all. And we hope to be speaking with you at a later point.